Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday after Thanksgiving. Who's full still? All right. My favorite thing is a cranberry sauce. Got to be honest. I love it. The Bible says in Psalm 113, who can compare to the Lord our God who is enthroned on high? Stand up and sing with us, y'all.
Uh, good morning, church. Happy Thanksgiving. Great to see you all. I hope you had a wonderful holiday. Uh, mine was good, but I'm a little sore. My nieces like to play obstacle courses on the playground, and I've used some muscles I didn't know existed before, but <laughs> they're sore now, let me tell you. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, if this is the first time here, welcome. We're so happy you're worshiping with our church family today. Uh, if you'd like to let us know you were here, there's uh, cards over in that kiosk there, uh, or if you have questions, there is a welcome center in the lobby that can answer anything you'd like to know. Uh, so as far as announcements go, we have a lot of Christmas stuff coming up. Obviously, Advent. Is Advent this week or is it next week? Anyways, Advent soon. It's coming up next week. sometime. The, it's been, 97.1's been doing Christmas music for about eight weeks now, so I guess we're in the season, right? And uh, okay, so a couple things. First off, uh, on December 10th at 9 a.m., we're going to do a one-off special Christmas seminar. Uh, I'll be teaching something on, called Christmas Myths and Misconceptions. We're going to talk about the Star of Bethlehem. We're going to talk about the prophecies coming into Jesus. We're going to talk about who these magi were. Uh, a bunch of different questions around Christmas. I think it should be really, really fun. Uh, second, uh, and maybe biggest, next week we are having our Advent, uh, CPC Kids Advent Block Party. Uh, it'll be following the 1030 service uh, up in 206, and it's going to be a huge festivity. We're going to have pizza, we're going to make, we're going to have all these different stations, Christmas ornament making, uh, Christmas cookie making, a family photo booth. It should just be really great. And this is really for the whole season, but you, I'd really like to challenge everyone, if you know a family that you think might be interested in coming to some, something like this, Christmas season really opens some doors for invitation where people are willing to come and try to be a part of something or, or try church out. So really think, is there a family who might want to come to that? Uh, so it's called the Advent Block Party because it's like a block party, but we also have our Advent Blocks. And families, if you still would like this amazing tool for helping to disciple your kids through the Christmas season, there's still about uh, 15 or so of them left. You can pick those up uh, after the service. Just talk to Jill. And lastly, on December 2nd from 9 to 11 a.m., Saturday morning, there's going to be a women's uh, Christmas, how are we calling it, breakfast. Uh, it'll be great. There's going to be food. Sarah Armstrong is going to be talking and sharing a little bit about the ministry home stretch, uh, but just come for this amazing way for, for the women of the church to have fellowship together. Thanks for worshiping with us. invite you guys to stay in and sing with us.
going to sing one of our favorite songs. It's gratitude. I think gratitude invites us into God's presence. When we are grateful, God loves it, right? Our spirits are refreshed and renewed in God, in Him. God loves to give good gifts to His children. He really does. But I think one of God's favorite things is gratitude and part of our worship to Him. He delights in our thankfulness. Lord, we thank you for just your grace and your love and your son, Jesus. All my words fall short. I've got nothing to do. How could I express? I could sing this song as I often do. Every song is sing and never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one.
Stay standing as Kaylee reads our scripture for us this morning. Join me in prayer. Dear God, please open our ears to hear your word, open our eyes to see your vision, and open our hearts to welcome you in. Today's scripture comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, when he commits inequity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. And I took it from Saul, whom I put away from you before, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, I'm going to pray, and in one thing I'm going to pray for in particular you can join me in is um, I have uh, a painfully sore throat, and so I'm just praying we get through the message. If at some point I just randomly say, let us pray, you'll know that that hit the end of Aaron's throat. So um, I am feeling fine otherwise, I, trust me, um, uh, germ-wise, but boy, sometimes the sore throats won't go away. So if you'd pray for my throat, I would take that. Um, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you do in our world around us, the things we see and the things we don't see. Lord, now we ask that you would move in ways that we see and maybe in ways that we can't see as we read your word. And we simply do one thing. We ask you to speak to us. We ask you to teach us. We ask you to chasten us. We ask you to encourage us. We ask you, Lord, to be our strength now as we read your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Um, it's funny the things that stick in your head sometimes. Uh, they're things that you would never have thought they'd stick in your head. Uh, and definitely nobody around you would know that's what you're going to think about the rest of your life. Um, but here's one of them for me. I knew a girl in seventh grade whose actual first name was Hope Springs Eternal. She had a middle name, she had a last name, but her first name was Hope Springs Eternal. Which if they're 13, you pretty much dread the first day of school. When they're going to read your name straight off the roll the way that it's legally pronounced, Hope Springs Eternal, right? And I always 
was in uh, uh, several classes with her. And again, I was 13. I was not a mature person. I, I can't say whether I'd be any better now. But I just remember every time we'd have a substitute teacher, I would get so excited. Because I knew the substitute was going to do what substitutes always do. Right? They would read the names literally off the roll. And they would come to Hope Springs Eternal. And then she would call out, Hope Springs Eternal. And then Hope Springs Eternal would say, it's Hope. Because <laughs> when you're 13, the last thing you want is to be called Hope Springs Eternal. Right? And every time she'd explain it was hope, and every time the substitute teacher would have that look on her face like, you know, I don't want you all messing with me today, because once this gets out of hand, I'm not bringing this class back around. And so sometimes she would be called hope, and sometimes the entire class she'd be called hope springs eternal. And uh, I just smiled every time, because again, I was a 13-year-old boy, right? Um, but here's the other thing that happened every time, besides me being 13 and sort of giggling every time they called her hope springs eternal. 18 times a class, which I still sort of smile at, right? Uh, it meant that actually, like, every time it would happen, I would actually find myself wondering about our parents, right? Because that's the real question, right? Well, our names say a lot more about our parents than they do about us, right? Are we going to be hip and cool? Did you look your name up off the name list? So many of us are like, really? Really? You had to pick that name? Um, what does it say about these parents that looked at this little baby girl and said, your name shall be Hope Springs Eternal, Samantha Smith. I don't know, right? I, never, I don't even know her last name, right? This idea in two parents' heads that they wanted something to be represented in their daughter's life, that, that hope isn't a possession. Hope isn't a character trait. Hope isn't a way exactly, exactly a way that you're thinking, but that hope is something that's in you, and it just keeps coming up. Life cuts it off at the bud, and yet there the next day, it's, op uh, it's up again, right? Hope that won't stop growing, that no matter how many times life takes it down, it's back the next day. That's actually a pretty miraculous thing, right? Um, for many of us, I think hope is a little more like a prize fighter. I don't know if you've ever watched many boxing matches. I don't know why I think boxing is like the sweet science and UFC is like barbaric. It's probably, they're probably both barbaric. But, you know, there's always a moment in a fight. You see these two people come into the ring, and they're both clearly in peak physical condition. Both of them look like you don't want to mess with them. And yet there's usually a moment in the fight where somebody lands a punch, or sometimes somebody just whiffs it and misses in the air. Somebody suddenly stumbles back and barely catches their balance, and you realize, oh my gosh, he's breaking. This perfect person that appeared to be in just perfect physical form, so ready for this fight, suddenly one of them breaks. And you usually know right then, it's going to begin, they're going to begin to, to trickle downhill. You already know in that moment when they lost their footing, when they went off balance, when they whiffed it, when they took a punch, and you just see the fight leave them, right? They start to break, right? For many of us, hope is a little like that. We're hopeful people, we're faithful people, but there's a moment where life just keeps punching, or keeps confusing us, or keeps just not being the life that we clearly set out to live. And there is a question of how deep does the hope go? How much does it spring eternal? We're coming to the end of David's life here, a whole series in the life of King David. And, and it's interesting, one of the things that we've seen again and again in in David's especially younger years, uh, was this tendency to be the strongest as a person, spiritually, as a leader, to be the strongest when things were actually at their worst, right? And that's actually true of many of us. Sometimes we rise to the occasion, don't we? Um, and it goes a little like this. Like when life is going well, it's just very hard to not start to shift the weight of your confidence, the weight of your energy, the weight of your passion, to not to begin to lean, to lean a little more on all these earthly things that are going well. Like career's going well, we finally got that house, retirement's looking good, my kids are perfect, um, or whatever it is, right? And it's just, no matter who you are, no matter what your faith is in Christ, it's hard when life is going well to not just sort of start to put more and more of your weight on the fact that things are going sort of well. And yet there is something when life starts to not go well, and we can't lean upon the perfection of our family. Um, uh, I'm not going to say any more about family. Right? <laughs> uh, we can't lean upon the, the pl perfect plan of our career. We can't lean upon the fact that our major was selected just right. We can't lean upon those things. We can't lean upon those relationships that we've been working on. And, and the funny thing is, we say it's a bad thing. It's not a good thing that life is not going our way anymore, to put it mildly. But, but sometimes the truth is, it's the fact that the life is giving way, that it can't support us. It can't sustain us anymore. We know our hope can't be in that thing, that we just again begin to shift our weight back onto something that is deeper, right? That is God, right? 
Um, and that's a powerful thing, to walk through life each step of the way, finding your actual hope, your actual strength in Him. And that's why you find people that have grown and grown and grown in Christ. It's not always that they're the smartest or they can quote every Bible verse, uh, although it's great not to know the Bible. A lot of times what you discover is that there's a peace and a strength that flows directly from God and through the cross into them, and it's sustained by their faith in Him. And that relationship is what sustains them in life, right? In a way, I just gave you the end of the sermon because I don't want you to miss it. Now I want to jump back, right, because we are at the last sermon as we look at David's life, right? And today, I, what I want to do is not do the thing where you go to the last, his dying words, you know. Saw the Napoleon movie last night. Does anybody want to know the ending? You've had 200 years, right? No, his dying words were uh, France, army, Joseph. Right, and he dies, right? Those are his dying words. We're going to get to David's dying words, but what I want to do um, is, uh, is actually go back to this moment in the middle of David's life that sometimes we actually overlook when we're reading our Bibles, and yet the more time has gone by in God's history, the more people have begun to realize that actually this moment, this quiet little moment in the middle of David's life is actually the supreme moment of David's life. In fact, in time, if you want to talk theologically, they would go back and call it the Davidic Covenant. A moment when God, for no reason, David didn't earn it, God simply showed up in David's life and said, and now I make you promises, right? So let's jump through it, and then we'll come back around to this idea of hope in the end, and where do we really have it? Uh, we're going to see three things. Um, a key misunderstanding by David. Uh, I will also then, the second thing we'll see is a key claim that God is making through it all. And the last one is a powerful promise that is ultimately made uh, by God. And I'll just tell you, we need them all just as much as David did. So the first one's this, right? There's this key misunderstanding that David started out with at our scripture. Maybe uh, you noticed it. And, and the basic misunderstanding David had is that God was blessing David. David could see that he was hallelujah blessed. Um, that God was blessing David in a way in order to gain earthly, uh, earthly glory, right? I'm going to bless David. Uh, and then David's going to worship me, David's going to glorify me, he's going to be a king after my own heart, and then God will get what God had wanted out of David. But where does the scripture begin, if you remember? It says, now when the king, that's David, he lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest. The Lord had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies. And the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, right? This is this is David, right? Have you ever had that moment where you're sitting on the sofa, and let's just be honest, you went to Best Buy on Friday, and you did, in fact, get the 97-inch plasma screen, or what, a QLED, OLED TV, and it's glorious, and you're sitting there, and you're thinking, what am I watching this beautiful Samsung product, 97 inches of glory, the Avengers has never looked this good, Harry Potter has never glistened like this, and then you suddenly think of your neighbors with a mere 75-inch TV, and you feel like you should probably invite them over, you know, to receive some of the earthly glory that you want to share now, right? There's a little bit of that, right? Where David is in peace and prosperity, and he's a faithful man. He knows that God has given him rest. And David looks at this palace that has come to him uh, through his rise as king. And then he looks at the Ark of the Covenant, which we talked about last week, the symbol of God's presence. And he, and he sees that it's sitting in a tent, right? What's interesting is the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant had always been housed in a tent because it was meant to be portable. Wherever God's people were roaming, God would go with them and they would set up this tent. He had to have a portable church, in a way, uh, because God's people were always on the move. And now suddenly David had home. He had bricks and mortar and everything else. And he thought to himself, you know what, here am I sitting in a palace. God should be sitting in a palace too, right? And of course, what's interesting is it was a probably a good idea. I want to honor God. What's wrong there? Except Nathan, Nathan says right then and there, he says, uh, and uh, go and do all, David, that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. David, uh, Nathan just makes a judgment call. He says, David, God's always been with you. It makes perfect sense that you would want to build a beautiful place of worship for God that, that rivals or surpasses your own palace, right? Good idea, David, go with it. Except what happens, if you remember in verse 4, suddenly that same night, Nathan goes home, and the word of the Lord comes to Nathan, and God says something very different. He says, uh, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, 
And the irony really is in the words, right? Would you, let me get this right, David, you would build me, God, a house to dwell in? Like, that's what you think you're here for? That's what it's like? Um, when Amy and I were first married for about a year, year and a half, you can clarify later, I, I'm sure you'll remember this moment, um, I had the brilliant idea on Amy's second birthday that we had as a married couple um, to buy her a beautiful sweater, a nice green sweater that was warm and cozy, and wrap it up and hand it to her and say, here you go, have a sweater, right? Which I just want to tell you, if you're shopping for your spouse you, you know, on their birthday, like, I don't know what your marriage is like, but usually you don't want to go with sweater. Just write that down. It's a side point, right? But here was the real catcher. I mean, maybe it wasn't the most amazing, thoughtful gift ever. It, it turned out that she actually already had that sweater, um, that exact sweater in that exact color, and wore it regularly, uh, which implied so many things about me, and, uh, and I th I'm still trying to live out of that reality, right? Um, and there's a little bit of that with David and God right here, where David loves God, and David picks out a gift for God, and the gift is, I will build you a palace. And God says, David, why would you think I want a palace? It's interesting, David earlier talks about um, how his house is made out of cedar, and cedar at that time would have been like the most expensive imported materials you could get. Because in that area, you didn't have super tall trees. So uh, homes were built out of bricks and mud and th things like that. They were, tend to be low level because you didn't have a, a, you know, an inner structure that could support multi-level uh, homes. But if you had a timber home, if you actually had the money to have ship in giant logs from the coast where the trees grew tall, then your, town would, your house would be more beautiful and it would literally tower over everything else in town. And so David was literally saying, uh, wow, I'm in a house of cedar. I've had the best building construction materials brought in from the coast. I literally, you see my house for miles around. Um, and he imagines himself doing something di similar for God, right? And yet God has that amazing, amazing comment later on. Would you build me a house to dwell in? Have I not lived in a... Have I not already lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day? Have I not already had a tent that was just fine, really? Like, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with the people of Israel, did I ever say a word to anyone about the tent, right? Uh, with any of the judges that I raised up to protect Israel... Uh, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel. And all the times that I created a people and shepherded the people and I went with the people and I walked with the people and I cared for the people and I raised up the people they needed to protect them and shepherd them like you, David, which are just a long line of humans that I've raised up to protect and care for my people. And I ever said, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? You ever heard me ask for a house of cedar, right? And so there's something going on here, right? There's... Um, it's more than just God correcting David's priorities, thinking, oh, you need a beautiful house. That's what, thing, that's what people on earth, that's how you get glory. So the tallest and most beautiful thing, and God should have a building uh, that, he is, uh, that represents him, that is the biggest and most beautiful thing in the world, and that's what would make God happy. David's incorrect on that. Like, God has been moving and powerfully in the lives of people forever, and he never said, oh, a tent is the problem in my life. So he, God corrects David's priorities, but here's something I think what's really going on. How is David really acting? He's sitting there in his, his palace, he's at rest, things are going well right now, and he's acting like it's mission accomplished, right? Like they've reached the point of all the drama, of all the warfare, of all the, all the things that God had done. The times God had moved powerfully on behalf of his people. Uh, the times that God had spoken, the times God had corrected and chastened, all the things that he had done, all that David's life had led up to. And that this now, him sitting in rest in a palace, is actually the point of everything God's been doing. You know, since that time when you called me to be king, the real point was to get me in a palace. The real point was for me to be at rest and feel, you know, really good about things, right? Um, and I want to make David to sound horrible, right? But there's this, there's this idea that David thinks now is the moment, mission accomplished. And what do you do? You hang a banner, 
you have a parade, you build a big house for God, it's the biggest house ever, and we say, God, you did it, all glory to you. You have given us a powerful city, a powerful army, a powerful king, plenty of economic prosperity, mission accomplished, God. As if the hard work is over, which may actually hint at David's future struggles, thinking the hard work is over. As if all the, things the, the, all the things that the Creator had been doing since the beginning of time was David. He wanted to make sure this guy David would have a castle one day, right? And I don't know about you. I really can't say much about you in your heart. I really, but I know for me sometimes, like, uh, even in the midst of my faith, in the midst of, you know, church life and everything, I can sort of slip into this idea in my prayers. It shows up in my prayers sometimes. Where the real point and the real energy of my faith... Uh, is that things would go well with me. Like, that's the real point of my faith. That's why I'm, like, worshiping and singing those songs and I'm praying these prayers. I mean, I know it's bigger. I know it's bigger. I know the right answer. But the place where I'm really passionate in my relationship with God is when my relationship with God might help things to go well with me or maybe with people that I love, right? Those aren't bad things, by the way, right? But there's something about when you make the bullseye of your faith, the passion of your faith, the joy of your faith is getting things to go well with you, getting things to go well with your family, hoping to see God act in that way, right? Those are powerful things. David is right to be thankful, right? This is basically David having Thanksgiving and then looking at the turkey and thinking the turkey is the point, right? Here's the thing. It's time for David to realize something, and it will be powerful in David's life, um, that God's purposes in David's life may have led him into a palace, Whatever David's life looked like, the God's great purposes for David's life go far beyond David and have very little to do with what kind of life David will have as he lives within the hands of God. That God's purposes, the reasons he's doing what he's doing in David's life go far, far beyond David. And that was David's simple misunderstanding that God's great blessing, that God was blessing him in order to gain a kind of earthly Glory. God doesn't lack for glory, right? The second thing we see here, though, uh, and, it, and, and it's getting bigger as we go along. God has a second key claim that is in everything that Kaylee just read for us in 2 Samuel, right? What God is really saying is, David, don't you see? I'm already the king. I'm the king here. David, you of all people who know that everything that you've accomplished has been at my hand and with my help and my blessing, and I sustained you through all those things. When you stood before Goliath, you had complete trust and confidence that you, that I, God, would win the battle for you. That it wasn't because you were the biggest or the strongest or the most experienced. It's that, that, that I could work powerfully on your behalf. David, you of all people should know that actually I've been the king all along right? Uh, 2 Samuel uh, 7, 8 uh, sort of summarizes a little bit, right? And now therefore, thus you shall say, this is, sorry, God talking to Nathan, telling Nathan what he wants to say to David. Now therefore, you shall say to my servant, thus says the Lord of hosts. By the way, hosts is sort of Old Testament language for armies, or at least a huge cadre, a huge group of people who stand and sing your praises and stand behind your back. So God's now sort of speaking of himself in a little bit of like huge, like he's speaking of himself like a king and a king that has the army of all armies a little bit, even if the armies are angels and they aren't there to kill, that he has like that behind him. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, David. Dude, you smelled like sheep. You smelled like sheep. Your brothers put you in the pasture, right? Because either you were the smallest or you didn't have a good strategy or maybe you're the youngest, but they put you in the pasture, man. You were watching the sheep and I came and found you there that you should be prince over my people Israel, right? Can I just finish the passage? Uh, it's notice the number of times and God isn't very like, he doesn't throw down the eye. You know, we always say to our kids like, you're using the word I too much, but this time God breaks that little rule because it's important for David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have, had, um, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on earth. And I will point to a place 
will uh, appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more with the violence and shall uh, and the violence shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel and I will give you rest David from all your enemies and moreover I the Lord declare to you that uh, declare to you that the Lord will make you a house David and, and he keeps going, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, right? And, and God basically comes around and he's like, no, 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 David. I, I, isn't God being, pri-? he's like, I don't need a house from you. I have chosen to bless you. I have walked with you through all of it. I've lifted you up. I've picked you up. I've called you out. And I've done it not just for you, but for other people, for Israel. I've done all of it. And not only that, now I'm not going to curse you. I'm not angry at you. I'm not doing anything. But I'm going to tell you, I am going to be the one to establish your future. I am going to be the one to decide what your legacy is when you're dead. Because you're all headed for the grave, right? I know it's a little morbid for Thanksgiving weekend, right? But it's like you literally have like that much time on earth. And what do you spend all your time worried about? Your legacy. Right, your legacy and pouring it in, and like, but you know what happens? You you die, and then there's like, okay, there's a couple Christmases where everybody talks about Granddad, <laughs> right? And then there's a few more where there's a picture on the wall, and then one day the picture comes down because you're renovating, you know, the the living room, and the picture goes in a box, and then there's grandkids, and, the, and pretty soon, like, no, like, David, if you want to have any of the things you really want to have, you need me to give them to you. I'm the only one that can give you the legacy you long for. I'm the only one that can make your life last forever because of the life in which I was using you and what you were doing with your life was all tied up. And it's interesting. Um, in a way, God is claiming the kingship of Israel back from David, right? And he sort of puts David in his place in a way, right? And yet he does it in this marvelous way where he says, oh no, David, I'm going to bless you even now more than you've ever seen. You think you're thankful now? You think you're at rest now? You think you're doing well now? Wait till I'm done establishing your legacy. But understand this, David, it will always be me. I will be the one making your name great. Uh, it's a little bit like, remember Denethir, steward of Gondor? Of course you don't, because I'm being a nerd. Like, nerds do this thing where they watch Marvel movies and Lord of the Rings, and then they talk like it's real, right? I don't know what to do with those of us that are a little nerdy, right? But if you've read Lord of the Rings or watched the movies... One of his key pop points is this guy, Denethor, Denethir, probably said it wrong, who is the steward of Gondor. He's basically the king. He sits on the throne. He tells the armies what to do. He collects the taxes. He's a big, big deal, and he has the clothes to match, right? But then there's this point where the real king shows up in the middle of the movie. Finally, the king, that he has always been taking care of the country until the real king shows up. But what happens when the real king shows up? Denethir struggles a little bit with this idea that, that oh, I've, I've said my whole life I'm waiting for the king to show up. So my whole life ruling until the true king arrives, except when the true king arrives, Denethir discovers he's gotten used to the chair. He's gotten used to the throne. And in the story, I think what really happens is that he basically kills himself rather than give up the throne to be the true king. Sword of the Rings, everybody fights and dies, right? This would be a great place to stop and say, who's really on the throne in your life? And do you see that the connection between peace and strength and hope and joy, it actually comes back to you getting off the throne, right? What's really interesting is that if you go back and relook at what God said to David, you realize, oh wait, there's a pattern there. There's a pattern here that actually fits very well with what God said to Abraham so long ago, if you remember we studied Genesis, and when God came and said, I will make a covenant with you, Abraham, I will bless you, and I will bless your family, and through your children, all the, na- all the, um, all the, all the peoples of the world will be blessed through your family right? And we're spent to stop and be like, wait a second, everything God is promising David here, it's not just God saying, let me list all the things I did for you. There's this pattern here. What does he say? He says, David, I gave you a name. I made your name great. I gave you a purpose. I gave you a reason to be here. And I gave you a sense of identity in all these people. I gave you a name. And what does he else say? Before this, my people were always on the run. They were always being chased around by the Philistines. They were always, always, always on the run. But I gave you a place. I gave you a home. I gave you a chance to sleep in your own bed. I gave you a spot on the earth that is yours. I gave you home. What else does he say? I gave you rest, right? It says it repeatedly at the passage. I, David, I've led you to a place of rest. And now, David, I'm not just going to give you a name, because I never was in it just so you could feel like you had a strong identity, although you found your identity in me. 
I, and I've given you a home, I've given you a place, but I was never in it just so that you could have home. And I've given you rest, and I was never in it just so that you could have rest. Now I'm going to give you a legacy. See, God has just promised David and given David everything that he actually wants. We say we need a house. What we mean is we need a place in this world. We say we need a certain career or relationship, but what we mean is we need a name. We need an identity. We say we need a nap, but what we mean is we need rest, right? We say we need a plan and a purpose. What we mean is we want this life to count long after we're gone, right? And God says, David, I've already given you all those things, and now I will not stop until you have the legacy you've always longed for, right? God has always been the king, and David has this moment in the middle of his life where he has to just realize, oh, I sit on the throne, I've got a crown, I've got an army, but you know what? David ain't no king. There's only one king. He created me, he sustains me, he will give me my name, my place, my rest, my legacy. The true king is up there, not down here. And that comes to the last point, right? God's forever promise to David, right? Suddenly, if you get to the end of it, if you were still catching in, there's this verse that we just blip through, uh, and yet it starts to like dominoes falling over. Anybody ever watch the domino videos on YouTube? I know you do, because we all do, right? There's and you do one little domino, and it just starts spreading out, and the camera zooms back, and you're like, holy cow, it's that's actually like a whole gym, and then it's going into a pool, and then there's a dolphin, and then it's like domino falling down videos are amazing. And there's this tiny verse at the end that suddenly starts the dominoes falling, and they move all the way through the Bible. God says this, and your house, this house I'm going to build you, and your kingdom, David, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And God suddenly just goes a little too far, right? He suddenly says, and David, I won't just establish your legacy. I will establish your throne and your kingdom. And I promise you, David, your kingdom will never fall and your throne will never be empty. And everyone, even David's meant to be like, well, that, I mean, like, that's almost impossible. Like, it's, it's almost impossible. Have you ever heard of any kingly line or any, you know, the Kennedys? Right, right. Any family that's ever run a country or been like every nobody stays for that long. And you see, there's this pattern here that you and again, I won't take you through verse by verse, where God keeps saying, David, what I've done in your life, I actually did for Israel. Everything, every way I blessed you, it was to bless this people. But now I'm going to say something else. This people of Israel, the reason I blessed you to bless them was not even for them. It was for the world. Everything I'm doing in your life is really to do something in Israel. Everything I'm doing in Israel is really to do something in the world. And what I'm promising you is that I will never stop until the entire world has been affected by it. God's making a covenant promise to Israel, to his people. He's connecting it back to Abraham. And if you're like a little bit of an Old Testament scholar, and I, I know, right, this is the most exciting part of the sermon for me, it may be the part where you're like, that wasn't as exciting as Aaron thought it was, but here it is. We're meant to have a moment when God suddenly says, David, I will establish. I'm saying it out loud. I'm saying it in the prophet. I'm putting it in the Bible. David, I will establish your throne now forever, right? And we're meant to be, when we read the whole passage, just hang in there. We're meant to have this moment where we're like, dang, dang, bro. God was blessing David to keep his promise to Abraham like a thousand years ago. And God didn't forget his promise to Abraham. And he never forgot his plans for the world and to bless every people on earth and to redeem and restore this entire world and to create a people unto himself. And all those promises that he made to, to, to Abraham are now flowing right through David's life. And David is just a link in the chain. And David is so blessed to be a part of that, right? There's a theologian, a pastor in Australia, who in addition to being brilliant, has an Australian accent, which is totally unfair. It makes everything he says sound really smart. And he says this. I'm going to butcher this here, but i got to try this. i gotta, got to get some John Woodhouse in the house, right? He says, Those who know and receive God's promise see all things in a brilliant new light. Life and death, prosperity and suffering, beauty and ugliness, love and hope and their despair, all now illuminated by the brilliant light of God's promises in Christ, which will never fade. Their life cannot go dark. That's pretty great, right? Some of you are like, dear Lord, don't do that in the second service. 
And I mean, do you have that in your life, the brilliant light of God that comes through his promises, first made to Abraham and then to David? Do you realize that everything that we saw God do in David's life, it wasn't just for him, it was for Israel. It wasn't just for Israel, it was for you. If you know the name of Christ, then you were always a part of why God did everything that he did in David's life. And the best thing for David's life is to know that he would never know Beth Mitchell, but his life was for Beth Mitchell. He would know, never know Carolyn York, but his life was lived in Christ because God gave him his purpose through Carolyn York and on and on and on and on. God worked in David's life for you and for me. And of course, uh, it gets bigger and bigger. That's why, have any of you ever had that moment when you were kids? You don't have to admit this, you know, where it was like, Advent and Christmas was coming, or maybe you were at the Christmas pageant, and it was time for the reading of the scriptures, right? And they were going through all the scriptures, and you finally realized, oh, it's time for the genealogy. You know, like 20 minutes of Old Testament names that no one can pronounce, and you have to, when can we sing again? I think we're doing Holy Night after this. Do you guys get, this is why two of the four biographies of Jesus in the Bible start with genealogies. Because to the people at that time, the most important thing for, was for them to see that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of everything God promised David. The book of Matthew actually announces this, right? The book of the genealogy of Jesus. That's how, it describes, uh, that's how it describes the whole story of Jesus, is that God is finishing the genealogy of David, right? The son of David. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah, and Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of, um, okay, I'll skip ahead, I know, I know. And Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph. And again, because I love you, I'll skip forward a few verses. And after the deportation in Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abelud, and Abelud the father of Eliakim. And again, because I love you, I will skip forward a few verses. And Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And so all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations were meant to see that God was always moving in the lives of people from Abraham to bring us Jesus. And David was a part of that. Everybody wanted to know Everybody want to know, wait, this guy Jesus, wait, you're saying he's the son of David? Like he's the son of David? Because we thought, we thought God had forgotten. Like we just thought maybe he had forgotten or given up or something. And then suddenly there's a son of David that is walking around like a king. And that's why you hear those famous words. This is why these words are so powerful. We just don't always know them. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord, sh Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear, do not behold, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And the shepherds ran into the town to say, we've just been told there's a new king that has come named David. And he's, he's here miraculously. Like he's the king of all kings, right? That's why everybody was so excited about Jesus. Do you realize when you celebrate Christmas, what you're celebrating is the fact that God is keeping his promises now and forever over thousands and thousands of years and he's never faded and then at the end right what do we see a throne at the very end of the bible and then i saw revelation right i saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence earth and sky fled away from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them 
And I saw the dead among the small, and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, in which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. I know this is exciting, right? <laughs> and they were judged, each one of them according to what they've done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. But then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. David's city, right? A new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And now will he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them, and them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. And neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. That is our hope. That is what God was doing in David's life the whole time. It was never about a palace or a battle or anything else. It was guaranteeing for you and me that when he makes a promise, he keeps it. And we, friends, if you are a Christian, you behold the promise. You are the recipient of this promise that every tear will be wiped away and that you will live in a new city and a new earth and this world will be restored completely. And that is Christmas. And that's why all those times when that poor girl or blessed girl, Hope Springs Eternal, would have a substitute teacher, and I thought to myself, what a horrible name to give a poor kid, right? <laughs> about the 19th time of thinking about her parents and thinking about her name, I walked over to her and I said something that 13-year-old boys very rarely say to a 13-year-old girl um, with complete sincerity. I said, hey, Hope, I really like your name. Thanks for having it. Because every time that I was reminded that hope can spring eternal, I remembered God. I remembered what he was up to in the hallways and the classrooms of White Station High School in Memphis, Tennessee in 19, I'm not going to tell you, right? Hope can spring eternal. And it can be yours. And that's the message of the life of David and Jesus and Abraham and you. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the life of David. Thank you for his faithfulness. Thank you for the lessons you've taught us, Lord. Carry us into Christmas. Lord, each day of the weeks to come, Lord, fill us evermore with that sense of hope, that sense that you are not done in this world. Let us see you act. Let us see you move. Let us see more of Jesus, Lord. Let your grace fill our hearts. Sustain us in all things, Lord. For the next few weeks, we claim you as our God and our King, and we ask you to move powerfully in our church family, in our families, in our lives. Amen and amen. 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 Thanks, Aaron. Stand up and sing, everyone.
Uh, you can all have a seat. Thanks. Uh, if I could have the people who are our new members, please come up front. Uh, so we've had a pleasure. We had four uh, new families join the church last week. We have three more this week, a couple more joining soon. It's just fun to see uh, all the wonderful uh, ways that God has been blessing and growing our church as of late. You guys can come up. Uh, you know, in a world, in a day and age where people are drawing farther apart, you guys stand in the middle right there. Thank you so much. Uh, in a day and age where the world is drawing farther apart, where relationships are harder, uh, where friendships are more difficult, where people feel more lonely, more isolated, heck, where people can just be more aggressive, right? I feel like sometimes when we have interactions with people, we hold our breath because of uh, what an aggressive world we live in. We want, in many ways, for our church to go the opposite of direction of that. Uh, we want this to be a family. Uh, you know, when I think of what our CPC is at its highest aspiration, it's not a mega church. It's not getting thousands of YouTube views or something like that. No, no, it is a place of intimacy where we are a family together, God's people on his mission together in each other's lives. And so thank you for coming up here. In many ways, that's what membership is, is us coming and making a statement that that's what we want to be together. Uh, Jesus, Jesus prays this for his followers. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are, I and them and you and me. That's an amazing aspiration, right? The same, the same intimacy that Jesus has with God, that's what he wants us to have with one another. And so thank you for coming and making that commitment today. Um, just to introduce, uh, this is John and, and John and Carson Champ, and their kids Brinley and Mason. Uh, this is Kristen Herdman, and then Bob and Susan Beaver. Uh, definitely after this service, take a chance to, to get to say hi to them uh, in the hallway. But uh, I have a, a few questions for you guys, and then one question for the entire congregation. Uh, so, friends, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Will you promise to care for and support the purity and peace of God's church? And to all of you, will you fully embrace these brothers and sisters in Christ as a part of our life together, joyfully bringing their gifts into our work for Christ, humbly opening your life and your heart to them in Christian love? Will you? Great. Let us pray for our church together. Uh, God, Lord, thank you so much for these wonderful families that you brought here. Uh, thank you for their heart for you. Thank you for their uh, joy and the, just the joy of having them in our community together. God, I pray this is a place that will bless these families, that they will thrive here. And Lord, I pray that they will bring their gifts and their hearts and that they will be a blessing to all of us as well. Lord, we pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, guys. And for our benediction, and I just have to say as you're standing, I mean, I think every person here is, is accepted and fully loved before Christ and the grace of Christ equally. 
but dang, I love those boots on Brinley and Mason there. <laughs> that is pretty sweet. I'm so glad you guys are all here. Glad to have you a part of our church. Don't forget, it's time to download our church app if you haven't done it yet, Church Center. You go to your app store, you download it, or you can go by the welcome desk and we have people who can help you with it, answer questions, help you update your profile. And don't forget, after the 1030 service, we're decorating to celebrate Christ coming into the world. So come back after the 1030 service. There'll be some food. We'll put up the church decorations, get all ready for Christmas together. We hope you can come. Now let's end with these good words from God for you. May the grace and the peace, the ever-present promises of God, may they hang over your life. May they sustain you and lift you back up every time you are tempted to doubt. May you walk through this life. May you walk through this Christmas season filled with the joy and the strength and the presence and the power of God on this day and every day to come. Amen. Amen. Hey, good to see you guys. So oh, good well to dressed. I like the Thanks card. for doing this.